Hello, my name is Lewis Akers and I'm a member of the www.contour.co.uk editorial board and today we're going to be discussing Iran as part of Contour's series of videos on the movements on the march in North Africa and West Asia. Uh, today we are joined by an Iranian librarian, translator and producer of Iranian progressives called Frida Afre. Uh, she's written extensively on Middle Eastern politics, Marxism, and recently has had a chapter on Iranian perspective on the Arab Spring Point 2.0. Um, so I can't think of anybody better to be speaking to on this subject. Hello, Frida. How are you doing today? Hello, Louis. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. No, no, it's okay. So just to get kicked off um, on Iranian politics, some of our listeners might not have as much knowledge about Iranian politics, the history, and obviously as Marxist, it's so important to know the history about something because that really sets the scene. Um, so could you give us a sort of brief overview of sort of Iranian politics or history since 1979? So for people that don't know, there was a big revolution in Iran in 1979. How does that shape the landscape today and what are its sort of impacts? Uh, sure. Um, 1979 revolution was uh, extremely important um, and um, life-changing, uh, both in Iran and really had a big impact around the world, not necessarily in a positive way. Um, in 1979, the Iranian monarchical system uh, was uh, overthrown uh, by a popular revolution that involved uh, uh, workers, uh, strikes of oil workers, um, students, many of whom were um, leftists, uh, women, uh, women activists, and, and members of the um, um, national minorities in Iran, the Kurds, Arabs. And uh, uh, it was a revolution that had contradiction within it from the beginning. It was, uh, it was opposed to the uh, monarchy and opposed to US imperialism that supported the monarchy. But um, it also had uh, a, a, a strong participation by Islamic fundamentalists uh, led by Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who uh, was able to basically take over the revolution and um, uh, came back to Iran after the Shah was, uh, after the Shah left. Uh, Shah left in uh, late January and Khomeini came back in uh, February and uh, he was able to completely push the revolution in an Islamic fundamentalist direction. Um, and that is not necessarily where it would have gone uh, had things not, uh, uh, had, had there not been support for the Islamic fundamentalists, unfortunately from, you know, a good part of the, the left. Um, but unfortunately, what happened was that although there was a strong participation by leftist students and leftists in general in the revolution, and uh, although um, a good portion of the population was not necessarily religious fundamentalists, I did not support that direction, um, the leftists uh, believed that uh, because U.S. imperialism was the main enemy, uh, that um, Khomeini should be supported um, to, to overthrow the Shah, and okay. that challenging Khomeini would be helping U.S. imperialism. So what happened was um, when there were uh, protests that were trying to move the revolution further in a progressive direction, they did not get the support that they needed. For instance, in March of 1979, there was a there were large women's protests for International Women's Day. Women came out saying, "In the dawn of revolution, we have no freedom," or "We didn't make the revolution to go backward." And uh, some leftists supported the women's march, but most of them did not. And even those who supported the women's march said after a few days that women should stop their demonstration because it would play into the hands of US imperialism. Uh, 
There was also a, um, an uprising of the Kurds, a national minority in Iran who demanded self-determination and who were for the revolution. And uh, the Kurdish uh, uprising was also uh, brutally crushed by the uh, government, which came, become, became known as the Islamic Republic. And so the movements and forces that were trying to push the direction in a progressive, uh, the revolution in a progressive direction, they didn't get the support that they needed. Uh, would you like me to stop at this point or pause in case you have a follow up question? No, no, that's okay. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I was, I mean, just to sort of, I suppose, zoom forward just now that we've got a little bit of background um, around the sort of revolution um, to sort of 2009, um, there's a sort of other movement called the Green Movement, uh, which sort of crops up. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about the Green Movement in 2009? What sort of sparked that? Who, who comprised of that movement um, and what it was all about? Sure, the Green Movement, yes, that came much later. Um, so what happened was once the 1979 revolution was crushed, um, mostly 1981 is when the uh, Islamic Republic really um, uh, was able to really strengthen itself by doing mass arrests of the opposition and leftists and then and then the, uh, a war started between Iran and Iraq. Uh, it was actually started by Iraq, uh, but uh, what happened was that at some point after six months, Iraq would have been the Iraq under Saddam Hussein, which is which is also a brutal regime. They were willing to do a ceasefire, but the Iranian regime at that point wanted to continue the war because they thought it would be a good way of deflecting attention from the internal contradictions of the country and, and, and what was happening to the revolution with the counter-revolution <clears throat> becoming stronger. So um, uh, basically we had uh, uh, many, many years of, of um, counter-revolution and repression. Uh, 1988, uh, once the war ended between Iran and Iraq, and a war led to um, the death of um, uh, at least a million and many, many injuries and, and uh, people becoming disabled from walking over mines or soldiers being forced to walk over minefields. Once the war ended, the Islamic Republic did another series of mass killings of, uh, of uh, political prisoners um, opposition, um, members of the opposition, mostly leftists, um, um, at least 5,000 were executed at that point. And so um, there really uh, were no openings for um, expression of, of opposition until, or at least no, no really um, sustained visible signs until the 1990s, when um, you had the uh, you know, election for a more reformist president who was still part of the regime, but was willing to allow for some, um, some um, um, reforms concerning publication of books or films, uh, um, some, some very basic uh, rights, and even that to a limited degree. Um, and uh, then there was the, we saw the rise of another student movement. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, again, a wave of um, killings of opposition members, uh, um, uh, translators and, and writers were um, assassinated by the regime. And, um, uh, again, um, we had the continuation of the repression and then another wave of massive opposition <clears throat> came, uh, became apparent in 2009 um, against the fraudulent election um, where um, the um, uh, 
the, the candidates who had actually received the largest number of votes, uh, Musavi and Karubi, were, um, were uh, denied um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, pre the, the, the presidency. And instead, the person who became president was the um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who had also been president from 2005 to 2009, a, a demagogue and, a, and um, a, a very repressive uh, uh, person and, and, and a, a, a very strong advocate of the regime. Um, in 2009, uh, the, the movement against the fraudulent election um, became known as the Green Movement. And uh, at that time, the goals of the movement were reforms. Um, they were not the protesters, although all, there were massive protests in major cities um, and uh, involved um, but involved more of the middle class rather than you know, strong participation by, uh, by a working class. Um, and um, they demanded uh, free elections and they demanded reforms within the system. Okay. So okay. I'll stop at this point and if you, unless you, if you have a follow-up question and then I'll move on forward. Okay, yeah, just, I mean, just to check, I mean, was there a sort of radical flank to the movement or was it mainly a sort of liberal sort of middle class reformist movement in 2019? It was mostly a reformist movement, but in Iran, even demanding a free election is, is pretty it's radical. radical yeah. So uh, it brought in a lot of people who would have probably wanted more radical change, but thought that this was the best that they could get at, the, at that point. But the Green Movement was brutally crushed. The, um, the two candidates who received the most votes, uh, Musavi and Karubi, they, um, they were put under house arrest. Many, many people were arrested. Um, hundreds were killed. And so um, the, 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 the repression was quite uh, powerful and successful um, until um, another wave of, of mass protests, which arose in um, December of 2017. And <clears throat> this time, uh, it was different. This time, the protests were, first of all, they started by uh, the working class. They were um, not limited to the city, the, the main cities, but were more nationwide and included uh, smaller cities as well and, and rural areas. And uh, they uh, demanded, they called for an end to the regime, which was different from the Green Movement in 2009. They, uh, they called for an end to religious fundamentalism. They called for an end to the Iranian government's um, military interventions in the region. As you see, in 2017, the Iranian regime had already been militarily involved in Syria for, for at least five years. And uh, not to mention, you know, its intervention in in uh, Lebanon supporting the Hezbollah, which started at the same time soon after the Islamic Republic came into power and also uh, its intervention in um, Iraq uh, after the um, US, after US, the US invasion of Iraq in <clears throat> 2003, and also its, um, its intervention in uh, Yemen especially after 2015 with the Saudi invasion of, of uh, yeah, Saudi uh, invasion of uh, Sultan and Yemen. So um, this time the, the uprising was much more radical and it was really demanding an end to the regime and to, to its military interventions and an end to Islamic fundamentalism. And uh, it, um, uh, thousands of people were arrested, especially in the areas of the country that 
uh, have a largely uh, a, a national minority or ethnic minority population, which is the Kurds and the Arabs, Arabs in the south, Kurds uh, in the in the north, um, and uh, they uh, uh, the uprising that uprising too was basically crushed with um, thousands remaining in prison and their whereabouts not known. And, um, and of course, many were executed. And then there was another wave of, of uprisings in uh, 2019. And this time uh, it was uh, in relationship to the wave of uprisings in the region uh, that started in Sudan and then Algeria um, and then um, Iraq and then Lebanon. And this is and what's I, been that's what's been deemed the Arab Spring 2.0. Is that right? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Although some people don't like to only call it Arab Spring because they say non-Arabs were involved too. But yes, yes. And um, so in 2019, um, the the some of the same characteristics that we saw in 2017 arose again. Um, another very important characteristic of the 2017 uprising was the participation of women who became known as Girls of Revolution Avenue. And I just want to digress and then come back again to 2019. So a, a day before the 2017 uprising, a woman in Tehran uh, got up on an electrical post and took off her headscarf and put it on a stick and started waving it. And uh, she uh, became, she and others who did the same, uh, in both in Tehran and in other cities, other parts of the country, they became known as the Girls of Revolution Avenue. They were arrested and uh, they were put on trial. Some of them were released on bail. Some of them couldn't afford to pay bail. And some of them have fled the country by now. But um, that also became a very important um, characteristic of the Iranian uprising, the strong participation of women. Now, we saw that strong participation of women again in 2019 with many many of the protests even being led by women. And uh, um, <clears throat> what, was, what was also important about the 2019 um, uprising was that in addition to continuing to demand for a, a call for an end to the regime and to re religious fundamentalism uh, and to the regime's military interventions in the region, it also ended up Continue, it continued with um, popular protest against the um, uh, what the what happened between the U.S. and Iran uh, when the, uh, when uh, uh, the U.S. Um, assassinated uh, Iranian um, military general Qasem Soleimani. Um, at first, when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated in um, in um, January of 2020, uh, the Iranian government claimed that, oh, look at how a mass of people are coming out and mourning and look at how popular he is. But uh, in fact, uh, what happened was that in, um, uh, in retaliation for the uh, assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian regime threw missiles at um, U.S. bases in Iraq, and in the course of doing that, it actually ended up bringing down, uh, shooting down a plane, a Ukrainian plane, carrying 176 passengers, mostly Iranians, uh, that was leaving Iran at that point, and, uh, and killing, killing everyone on, on the plane. So that led uh, to protests inside Iran against what the Iranian government had done. The Iranian government had uh, first denied that it was responsible, uh, but then later had to take responsibility for what it had done. 
but those protests ended up becoming large protests ag again against Iran, against Qasem Soleimani, against the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the <clears throat> military, um, uh, Iranian military, which is also the major entity in, in, in charge of uh, cap uh, Iranian capital. And so it became, uh, um, it became a really, really important um, event in that uh, the, 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 the claims that the Iranian government had about the masses supporting Soleimani just show, proved to be so hollow. Now, during that um, uprising in 2019, at least 7,000 people were arrested. And again, mostly in Kurdistan and mostly in the Arab region of the country, in the Southern part of the country. And of those 7,000 people arrested, mostly unemployed youth, we, most of them are still in prison. And um, some of them have been executed, for instance, the, a, a beloved wrestler uh, by the name of Navida Afkari, he was executed several months ago. And since then, two of his brothers have also been arrested and they're being tortured and they've been, they've received heavy sentences, like 20 years in prison each plus flogging. Uh, and then there are <clears throat> other political prisoners uh, who were in prison before um, the 2019 uprising, uh, or women or Girls of Revolution Avenue, or uh, attorneys who were defending the Girls of Revolution Avenue, and they're still in prison. For instance, we have um, uh, Nasrine Sutudeh, who's uh, an Iranian human rights, uh, um, a, a feminist human rights attorney. Uh, we have, um, uh, there's Nargese Mohammadi, who is the um, who's, uh, was the head of the campaign against um, the death penalty, and she is currently out of prison, but she just received another heavy sentence. So she was in prison at that time, recently got out, but she's just received another heavy sentence, and they they will the regime is forcing her back into prison. Then there are others, uh, other feminists like Atena Daemi, Goldroch Irai, Zainab Jalalian, who's a Kurdish woman prisoner. Um, there are Arab women prisoners. There are Baha'i women prisoners. Um, and then there are, of course, um, 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 activists who were involved in these uprisings, labor activists and uh, environmental activists and student activists. And some of them are in prison as well uh, from the teachers union, from the um, sugarcane workers union, uh, from um, um, railway workers and oil workers, and um, and then of course uh, the um, we have the continued in imprisonment of uh, Kurdish and Arab activists who um, are imprisoned for simply for wanting to use their native uh, uh, tongue as a language of instruction or um, simply advocating civil rights for the Kurdish and Arab minority in Iran. So it's a very interesting and very diverse uh, um, uh, group. Uh, and uh, um, there's so much more that I can talk, uh, talk about when it comes to the the uprisings and who participated in them, but I think I'll stop at this point in case you'd like to ask questions. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the, um, you mentioned a little bit about the labor movement. So what sort of role did the labor movement play in this sort of 2019 movement? Was there um, sort of workers and um, protests, strikes? Um, what sort of role did they play? Okay, so the, both in 2017 and 2019, the labor movement was very important in the sense that the 2017 uprisings, uprising was preceded by many sustained labor actions okay, and okay. also um, 
actions of families of labor activists who were in prison and uh, um, their demands for solidarity. Um, so maybe there was not a one-to-one -one relationship, but all of these activities and, of, and all, also the activities of women in defense of their rights, um, those were all mm, uh, seeds, I would say, that were there and, and started to, to grow and, and bloom. And, and of course, the, um, the, the more uh, explicit expression of labor participation, I would say, is that, for instance, during the past few years, we've had um, we've had labor, we've had uh, various strikes of the sugarcane workers in the southern part of Iran, of oil workers. We've had uh, strikes of ra railway workers, of steel workers. We've had strikes by teachers and nurses, uh, retirees. We have a very, very active organization of retirees, mostly led by women. The nurses, the teachers, and the retirees they're mostly led by women. Um, and uh, just right now, we have an ongoing strike of, uh, of contract and temporary uh, oil workers, oil and petrochemical workers going on in, in Iran right now. And it's become, it's not only in the South where you would, th you would think it would only be in the South, which is where most of the um, oil refineries are, but it's, it's uh, throughout the country. And they're demanding uh, not only better wages and better working conditions, but also an end to police surveillance and uh, the right to organize. And the, those, the latter two demands are actually quite significant for Iran. Mm. Now, uh, we, we also had a, a so-called election in Iran um, uh, last, uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, of um, and the person who uh, um, who supposedly won is a man by the name of Ibrahim Raisi, who um, has a very um, horrible history. Uh, uh, he was one of the judges that uh, was on the committee that uh, ruled on the execution of at least five thousand political prisoners in 1988. And uh, he was also uh, the head of a, uh, one, of the, one of the largest um, sections of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, the, their financial arm. Uh, it's called Orb, or in Persian, it's called Astana Qutserazavi. And uh, then he became the head of the Iranian judiciary. And now he has become, supposedly he has been elected president. So um, he has a very bloody history and um, um, we have yet to see what will uh, happen in Iran in response to um, his uh, rise to power as a president, although he was already in power in many other ways. Um, but we do know that the, uh, a large portion of the population boycotted the election we, we've never really had free elections uh, under the Islamic Republic, but, uh, uh, but we do know that even by the standards of the Islamic Republic, um, this election was so, so fraudulent and that the whole of the, the way in which the government even didn't allow some of its own, um, some of its, some members of its own regime to run for office, just, showed that there was just absolutely not even a, a semblance of democracy here. And so um, we have yet to see what will happen um, now, but, uh, but, but the fact that the labor strikes are going on and this, this oil and petrochemical worker strike is, is important and it's very significant. And just a, a, a few times you've mentioned sort of um, sort of mass arrests, imprisonment, um, sort of 
uh, the sort of hinted at sort of police brutality. You've written a lot about sort of the parallels between sort of police brutality in Iran and the sort of Black Lives Matters movement in the USA. And I think it strikes me as quite important to sort of pull out this sort of common cause and to build a new sort of universalistic form of politics. I mean, could you sort of pull out some of those parallels between the Black Lives Matter struggle and the struggle against sort of police brutality, mass arrests in Iran, and why it's important to do so? Sure, sure. And if you don't mind, I will add one more element. Yeah. I just wrote an article uh, published in New Politics just a few weeks ago, connecting the the uprising in Myanmar to the Black Lives Matter uprising and the, the, the struggles against police brutality and authoritarianism in, in Iran. And um, I think there are several important connections. One is that um, there was, there was certainly there are all struggles against authoritarianism and uh, the way in which uh, state uh, brutality is used to, uh, to crush um, people. Um, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, it, it's, um, it's uh, I, I think during the past, uh, since February 1st coup, they've killed at least 800. The army has killed at least 800 people and has arrested thousands. Um, another important connection between Myanmar and, and Iran is that in Myanmar, they also have uh, a di an ethnically diverse population. And uh, they also have a women's movement. Um, but it, it, they're way ahead of Iran in the sense that the, um, the underground government at this point, uh, they are advocating federalism uh, to recognize the rights of the national minorities, especially the Rohingya Muslims yeah. who have been subjected to genocide, a million Rohingya Muslims. Um, and uh, um, they, they also have, have strong support for the women's movement. And uh, so those have been two strong features of the Myanmar uprising. The, uh, in Iran, um, we have both of those elements, but the Iranian opposition has never really, has never agreed to the idea of any form of federalism or self-determination or autonomy for the national minorities, which is one reason why I, I believe the um, opposition in Iran has, has had problems is that it has not acknowledged that, that, that it needs to address, address ways of of, uh, I, I, it needs to recognize the rights of, of oppressed ethnic my, and national minorities. And um, the opposition has also um, not supported uh, feminism and women's struggles as much as it should. Um, now, um, back to Black Lives Matter and, uh, and Iran. Um, I think in addition to the shared struggle against authoritarianism and um, actual police killing, uh, in, this, in the case of Iran, it's the, both the police and the army and the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guard, various types of, we have, what, we have the regular army and then we have the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Um, and then in, in the case of Iran and uh, the US, we have, we, in both cases, we have mass incarceration. In Iran, um, the, the official prison population is <coughs> 190,000. The <clears throat> country's population is 85 million. In the US, the official prison population is 2.3 million and out of a population of 320 million. So we, we have that feature of both police brutality and mass incarceration. But I think one of the hidden commonalities is the, is the um, abolitionist struggle. And in a Black Lives Matter, uh, we have a strong abolitionist dimension uh, demanding the abolition of the prison industrial complex and also 
uh, calling for restorative justice and transformative justice. Restorative justice meaning repair of harm done and transformative justice meaning recognizing that <clears throat> you have to change the system as a whole and you cannot rely on state power uh, to, um, to uh, address uh, brutality uh, <clears throat> and injustice. In Iran, we don't have such a developed abolitionist movement or developed abolitionist concepts in the way that the US has. <clears throat> With thinkers like Mariam Kaba and Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson, Gilmore and Joy James. But we do have people like Nasrina Sotudeh and Nargisa Mohammadi who are feminist human rights activists in the case of Nasrina Sotudeh, a feminist human rights attorney who are uh, against the death penalty, who uh, would uh, I really identify with a lot of abolitionist views and who, in the case of Nargis Mohammadi, the reason she was put in prison in the first place was that she was the head of a campaign against the death penalty. So being against the death penalty in Iran is a crime. And uh, um, they would, uh, both Nazi Sutube and Nargis Mohammadi and many other Iranian, especially women political prisoners, they would definitely identify with the concepts of restorative justice and transformative justice. And I think it's also very interesting that this uh, in 2020, the alternative Nobel prize uh, was given to Nas uh, uh, Brian Stevenson, who's the US abolitionist um, attorney against the death penalty <clears throat> and uh, Nasrinis today. Uh, and then it was also given to two other uh, activists, one from Nicaragua and one from Belarus. But I think this coming together of abolitionism in Iran and, and the US, I think it was seen in the personified in, the, in Stevenson and so today getting the award. And um, I think we as activists really need to build on that. No, I don't. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the the sort of uh, the the rebuilding of a sort of universal sort of form of politics and struggle, uh, which is common to us all, is absolutely essential uh, if we want to build a movement that's going to challenge capitalism. Um, I mean, just so we can finish on a sort of maybe a slightly more positive note, hopefully, um, outside of the sort of uh, oil workers' strikes, uh, which are obviously extremely positive. Is, are there any other notes for optimism in Iran um, that the movement can um, either win um, concessions from the regime or can make fundamental changes to the regime? I think the most, the most hopeful note is the women's struggle in Iran. Because, and I, I was listening to a, a presentation by Nargisa Mohammadi actually a few days ago. She's out of prison right now and she has the courage to give a Zoom presentation despite all the dangers. Um, and she said, she said the reason the Islamic Republic has uh, crushed women's struggles so powerfully is that it feels so endangered by women's struggles. And yeah, I think that for Iran, precisely because of the uh, long history of patriarchy and misogyny, um, the women's struggles, the fact that women came out and spoke out against the compulsory veil and said that it has to be a matter of choice, the fact that women are still writing and even despite all the repression have produced novels and articles and blogs and people like Nasrin Sotudeh and Argus Mohammadi and Zainab um, who's Kurdish. Um, I think uh, that's, that's what we need to focus on. Um, the, and and, and 
uh, now we have a Me Too movement in Iran, which is also really important and interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm, I hope that the labor struggle in Iran would raise feminist demands as well. It's very important that they're now saying they, they're, that the oil workers are saying we're, we, are, we are against police surveillance and we want the right to organize or that the sugarcane workers are saying that we want our own independent workers councils running the factories. But it's very important for labor activists on the ground to say, we also support women's rights. Yeah. We support the right to ab ab abortion. We support the right to birth control. <laughs> they need to say that. We support the right to divorce. We support the woman's right to have custody of her children or be able to work without her husband's permission or travel without her husband's permission. They need to say that. Yeah. Well, it's always good to have a sort of note of optimism and something to see as a sort of beacon forward, I always think. Um, and I think you've definitely given us some sort of food for thought and some hope there um, with the uh, women in Iran. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to um, talk about today, uh, Frida? Anything else you'd like to mention or draw people's attention to? If those who hear this interview are interested in doing solidarity work, um, please contact me. My uh, blog is iranianprogressives.org or you can write to me at fafari2 at yahoo.com. So it's F as in Frida and then my full last name, A-F-A-R-Y at um, second, fafari2 at yahoo.com. Or just go to my blog, iranianprogressives.org and the email is there. Um, I really welcome that because there's so much that we can do um, for to toward international solidarity, and it's not only that we need to do it for others. It's that it helps the struggles in whatever country we're in, especially given that the authoritarianism right now is global. Yep, it's one struggle, uh, not multiple struggles. I completely agree. Um, well, thanks very much for uh, joining us today, Frida, and giving us some of your time. I know you're very, very busy uh, with thank all the different doing. things you're doing. Um, but if, thank you very much for everybody else tuning in. Um, if you'd like to um, look at uh, Frida's website, Iranian Progressives, um, or read any of the articles or the book that we've mentioned, there'll be links for them in the description of the show. Um, if you want to listen to any of our previous interviews about the region, you can check out videos on Lebanon, in Sudan and an overview of the region on our channel as well previously. And for any other content, written, audio or otherwise, you can visit conter.co.uk. Thank you.